there's so much hype around blockchain at the moment. Um, I thought um, doing my talk about it, it was going to be probably a mix of expectations about what I'm going to be talking about. Um, in fact, we are doing several real projects at ThoughtWorks that are going to go into production shortly in blockchain. So we thought it'd be really interesting just to have a look at some of the things that we're doing around architecture, tools and techniques and that kind of thing. Um, and think about how the hype about blockchain matches up to some of the reality that we're finding on real projects. I normally find whenever I'm talking about blockchain things with people, you get stuff like this and it's just this massive overwhelming amount of information and hype and startups and coins and ICOs and all that kind of thing. So um, yeah, that is definitely the hype about blockchain and that's not really what we're about at ThoughtWorks, what we're doing at the moment with it. So I'm going to talk about um, Two, uh, two or three projects. Um, one of them is actually an open source project. It's an EU research project. It's been a really interesting introduction to the whole blockchain space for us at ThoughtWorks. And that's something that you can all kind of get involved in and have a look at later on. Um, some of the other things are very confidential in terms of client work. A lot of these are financial services based organizations that are doing this kind of work at the moment. Um, so just looking through here, uh, the blockchain platforms, many of you, I guess, might be very familiar with Ethereum, Hyperledger, and Corda. Those are the three main big platforms that you'd consider if you were starting doing a blockchain development project. So what kind of functionality do these things offer you just out of the box or just getting it straight off GitHub? What kind of things are you going to get going with um, and doing? So um, Ethereum on the left here, the one thing that's been differentiating that from the start is that smart contracts are an inherent part of it. So it's really easy to get going with smart contracts on Ethereum. And I'll talk a little bit later about what smart contracts are a bit, what, um, what are the types of applications that you can do with them, and mention some of the kind of things that we're doing on the ThoughtWorks projects. Hyperledger in the middle there is a kind of slightly unusual one in that some of the functionality that's most needed on real world projects isn't actually there in the native kind of um, open source community version of Hyperledger. So uh, that's very interesting because there are definitely some, some things building up in the ecosystem around that. Um, Corda on the right there uh, is quite interesting. Corda is a consortium of financial services organisations, quite a lot of them now. They started off quite small with a handful of members, and that's grown over the last um, probably about two years or so. Um, and so really looking at financial services organisations having slightly different requirements from a blockchain uh, platform than, than some other types of use. One of the things that these organisations have started to do, the communities around them, um, there's Quorum, which is a financial services uh, consortium. This is working with the Ethereum Alliance and uh, basically looking at the idea of um, some of the privacy things that I just mentioned. There's loads of different matrices you see with different features on blockchain um, and different ledgers and different types of technology. There's a sort of hybrid ledger and blockchain technology. But from a real project perspective, this is what we're finding is the most useful aspect of it. You know, can you run smart contracts? You seem to need to be able to do that for absolutely anything to be useful on, on a blockchain. Um, and this idea of privacy and consensus, you know, is everything public to the whole world, world once it's immutable on a ledger? And what are the implications for that? So keeping something, um, something private. So um, we'll need to run some nodes if we're going to start building on a blockchain platform. Bitcoin has two um, models for nodes. It has a mining node and a full node. Many of you may know about this. I've never actually set up a miner. Um, it's quite, it is quite intricate to do. It was going to take me quite a long time. So I got a colleague to show me what their mining setup was and what they were doing with it, so, which is really interesting. So basically, you can see on the picture there, they have two, there, there were only two options for Bitcoin. It's a completely decentralized model, and it just means that anyone can do it, basically. So anyone can set themselves up mining or with a full node. And really, all you need these days is the hardware, and probably to spend quite a lot on electricity, because it's getting more and more expensive to actually um, successfully complete any mining. Um, and it, it does take quite a while now. So... We're looking at some of these kind of architectures. Um, this just gives you an idea that somewhere there needs to be nodes that do a little bit more management of things. Um, so obviously network monitoring and that kind of thing. Um, identity has been a really big theme that's emerged over the course of the last year or so in these projects. Um, I've got, we've got wallet down there on the diagram. 
and really wallet has become kind of almost ubiquitous as the term for how you manage an identity in the blockchain space. So whether it's um, a mobile app or things like MetaMask, uh, browser plugins, that kind of thing. Um, you know, but actually somehow you need to manage those wallets and know who's using your network if you're an organisation, especially financial services organisations. So we started to see things where we might have one or two or s several of these nodes that just do a little bit more stuff about kind of controlling the ecosystem. Um, on the right there, we've got just something about the pods. This is the idea of pod or, or node. We're finding lots of different terms mean, mean sort of quite similar things, actually. So, uh, you know, quite, quite straightforward on the, um, in, in some ways, the web front end, the API, and a data store. That's some kind of local data storage. So this is a project I mentioned, Decode, the um, EU research project. And this is a little bit of a different way of thinking about it because it's quite a complex thing um, to set up one of these Decode nodes, we're calling them. Um, it is, however, the hope for Decode that it's something that really um, allows people to take control of their private data. So it's for citizens to understand how their data is used and to be able to take control of it. And... Um, what we'd like to enable people to do is people without a lot of technical knowledge, you know, who might not have the expensive hardware or the technical know-how to set up nodes to be able to access the decode applications that are going to be developed. Um, so the idea of just being able to use your wallet to get onto the network. So you've got these kind of full nodes in the middle and then other nodes sort of around the outside of the ecosystem. So I suppose maybe slightly similar to the full node and mining node. So, so that was an interesting project in terms about thinking about evolving the architecture. Obviously, that's the thing that we've heard already today about evolutionary architecture and something we um, practice at ThoughtWorks. So it, we went through three sort of phases, I suppose, when we were going through how to get to that architecture and how we were going to take it on and build something after that. Prototyping, we had three small little prototypes to do different things to show, you know, just to kind of test out different options, what you would want on the ledger and what you wouldn't. Would these IoT apps just produce so much data that it was a nightmare to kind of keep it all somewhere? You know, how, how much, how many nodes would you have to run to do certain things? A scale model, that was then taking the petition app a little bit further and looking into more detail about how that would actually work in practice. Um, and then going on into production applications. So that's just work that's, um, that's going on in the moment. Um, the DECO project is having some pilots launched later this year in Barcelona and Amsterdam. So here we go. This is the uh, DECODE architecture. We've got um, the um, DECODE peer-to-peer -peer network in the middle there, validating nodes um, on the right. And then over here, we can see that the wallet does all these kind of um, things. There's a lot of functionality going on in there, basically. Um, so it needs to be able to run some crypto. It needs to do a P2P networking um, thing. It, it needs to be able to execute smart rules. So we're hoping that this wallet is going to be running on a mobile, but obviously that's quite a technically um, demanding thing to do on a small um, sort of portable device. Um, and then other people who are operators might be able to put together applications for Decode so that they can develop new things for citizens to, to consume um, securely and, and keep their data secure. So the big thing about the Decode project for users is entitlements to their data um, and really allowing people to use the data in the way that they choose and only how they want to. So starting to build it, this is the actual... Um, going from prototyping to uh, the next phases. Um, some tech stuff here. Uh, we've got the wallet proxy there in orange in the middle, a really important thing. We started to build that out in Python Flask. Um, it's a web, a web API, basically. So you can see different layers there on the integration environment. We've got the Ethereum um, layer kind of in the middle with the wallet connecting to that. Petitions layer at the top. And this is a pretty standard um, web um, application, really, with a, a database. Um, nothing particularly um, sort of unusual about that, really. Um, and just seeing how it connects into the petitions API and the wallet there on the left. This is the next, uh, the next step in Decode here. So we've got the, what the hub or, or node has become. We've got an OS for Decode now as well. You can see their chain space and Python in the middle there, which I'll mention in a minute. So the idea is all these things are all um, working together. Um, these are the end users there with the Decode wallet. Um, Tor is a private network, so Tor Dam is a project that's been developed that allows um, cryptography to run on um, kind of quite manageably sized devices. So, on to um, smart contracts, which I mentioned a couple of times now, um, and what the characteristics of them are really. So, three things are really important about smart contracts um, they've got to be permanent, they've got to be tamper proof, and they've also got to be irrefutable. And so obviously you had to get the World Cup uh, football joke in there. I think that was a pretty 
Um, pretty irrefutable kind of happening on Sunday afternoon there. Um, yeah, so basically smart contracts are just a piece of code which runs on a node. Um, they're not equivalent, analogous to a legal contract in real life. They're just another, another application, basically. Um, there are some things that are great for smart contracts and things that are not so great for them. So property transactions, recording something on a blockchain or ledger that's a high value transaction um, that's sold between two parties. You've got the buyer and seller and then other people need access to the information like solicitors and banks and that kind of thing. Um, royalty payments, um, people, people making small payments for music and that kind of thing. So that could be a good application for smart contracts. Um, Insurance, I don't think anyone's actually done this yet, but it could possibly be the case that you could trigger an insurance claim automatically if you have some kind of natural disaster or something that happens on the news or you know, somehow the system gets to know that you've had some incident that you want to, to claim um, on. And um, auctions is recording the result of an auction, eBay type things, but I think if they're more high value items, that could be quite, quite useful. Um, and the last one, this is one that's talked about a lot, petitions and voting. And this is kind of the first sort of... Um, the first example, I suppose, that people look at when they're looking at smart contracts is petitions. Um, and it's very interesting to see that this isn't just a sort of textbook thing, because we're doing this project for Decode in Barcelona, when, of course, um, you know, the Catalan independence thing happened during the course of the project. Um, so it's quite a real-world situation for them. They're really concerned about voting and really concerned about things being tamper-proof and no one being able to mess with the results, you know, with everyone kind of stealing the ballot papers and that kind of thing. You know, this, something like this could actually have been a real a really helpful thing to have for them. Just having a look at a little bit of the smart contract language here. This is um, just from the Solidity website. Just a bit of a sample of code here. Looks quite like JavaScript. And you can see at the top there the vote function. Um, quite straightforward, really. Um, Solidity, it's, 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 still, it's still early days for Solidity. It's not got a massive community around it yet, I guess. But there is, there is a JetBrains IDE plugin for IntelliJ for Solidity to help me with it. So I suppose it's gaining a bit, of, um, a, bit of, um, a bit more maturity and a bit of traction when it gets its own JetBrains plugin. So we've got the um, Decode project here. You can get involved with this on GitHub. Um, so that's the address there. Um, it's, o it's all open source, so you can have a look at things on there and find out more about the project. Some of the details of what's on there, so this is one of the things that we're working on, the Secure Petitions app for Decode. Just a little bit more about the actual details of the tech stack there. So a lot of it might be quite familiar to you. So we've got things like React, Clojure, Docker on the top there. Um, that's to do the web layer of the app. Um, the bottom there is the, the, the ledger blockchain layer of the app. And tools there on the right, so we've got Ethereum, test, RPC, Solidity, and Truffle. Should we use blockchain? This is the kind of million dollar question for a lot of projects, isn't it? What are the kind of things that you'd want to use it for? We normally would totally suggest going for outside in architecture um, in terms of building user value and business value rather than just building kind of technical things for the sake of it. So this has been really interesting as we showed some of the evolving architecture. It's been really interesting to think about it in a slightly different way because if you just think outside in, in a blockchain or ledger project, there's an awful lot of complexity in there that, um, that's easy to miss, actually. So things like how you might test a smart contract if it's on the ledger and if it's immutable, you know, what happens then? What happens if you need to remove something later? Lots of issues around GDPR are quite interesting. That obviously came in in May last year. So that's a big question. If you put something on a, on a blockchain, um, how do you deal with the right to be forgotten in GDPR? So it was, it was been, it's been a very interesting journey thinking about all sorts of architectural principles and then just, you know, how we can support certain features um, that we need to. Um, so the tool set is really... Uh, it's still in the early stages of maturity, as I mentioned, despite the JetBrains plugin, um, there are not a lot of tools for doing this kind of stuff. Um, and we tend to find that the communities around them um, are quite small, actually. They have slightly fragmented, I think. There's, Ethereum has a lot more um, community aspects to it with the Ethereum Foundation than uh, the other ones, than, than, some, than Hyperledger um, and uh, Corda. So it's just worth thinking about that if you're trying to pick a ledger um, what, which one would you go for, really? So um, tool set is quite a good uh, thing to think about. So it's not entirely a tech choice when you're thinking about these projects as well. It's, you know, clients really want to know about the longevity of some of these blockchain consortiums, um, where the funding's coming from, if somebody pulls out, what happens to the funding, are there a commercial organisation like R3 
um, and corda, are they a foundation like Ethereum? You know, what happens if they have an ICO? Um, what, what impact does that have if it goes not as well as it, as it could do? Um, yeah, so all sorts of things there to think about other than just the technical aspects of it. Um, and then testing. Um, as I mentioned, testing, there's, there's still, we're still battling through this, really, on projects. We're still thinking about how to do this, how QA is going to work differently on blockchain projects. And I think um, it may be that we just need to focus on that area a little bit more in the, in, the, you know, in the first phases of a project and just make sure that things are set up. I'm sure we'll see a massive load of tools in this area actually starting to come out, I would have thought, in the next um, six months to a year. I think one of the things I've really thought about over the last year is the, the hype around blockchain, you know, perhaps distracts from the fact a bit that it's all kind of cool and exciting and everything, but there's still a lot of really important stuff to do. Um, and, you know, the good practice of software engineering, it's never going to go away and this doesn't, this doesn't change anything really. It just means thinking about things in a slightly different way when, when you have got something that's immutable, when you have got smart contracts running. It's just a slightly different way of thinking about things. So... Conclusion, blockchain, it's turned out so far for us to be a really good solution, but not for every problem. I would say a lot of the things that we're seeing, we kind of don't think are necessarily a problem that's best solved by blockchain. And we've, we're in a great position that we've got some clients where, where blockchain really is the right problem, um, which, is, which is really nice. Um, so overall, I would say it's, it's definitely not gone down into the trough of disillusionment as far as ThoughtWorks are concerned. In fact, quite the opposite. We're finding it new and exciting. And... Um, Lots of, lots of things to look forward to in the future with it. So it's, it's a good solution overall. There we go. Thank you.